Mm -hmm. I think it's, you know, giving people a platform to tell their own stories is so important. People who have been marginalized their whole lives. Hi, this is Frank Schaefer, and you are watching and or listening to my podcast In Conversation with Frank Schaefer, which appears first as a Facebook Live event and then goes to YouTube and all sorts of other places where podcasts are available. And today I'm talking with uh, Jonathan Fisher, who is the editor of a book called In a Whole New Way, and also the, correct me if I'm wrong, um, the co-editor of the book and the writer-director of the movie by the same title. Un and the subtitle, which I guess applies to both projects, is Undoing Mass Incarceration by a Path Untraveled. Uh, yep. Did I get did I get the big strokes right here, Jonathan? Yeah, you got it. <laughs> okay, good. Nice. Um, I'd like to just start by saying that I, I watched the trailer and I read all the press information, and it seems to me that the context of your launch for this book is the book out. Yeah, the book was just published on June twentieth. Okay, because I have not seen the book, but. Um, the the movie uh, has gotten all sorts of acclaim that's reflected in the press kit. I wanted to ask you about the project and the context it's in which it's being released, and I'm going to ask you this question in a minute if you can remember it. And but then I want to get it to just who you are a little more before we get there. But what I want to talk about is the fact that it seems to me um, that the context in which this project is being released is that the Republican Party, every single candidate for the presidency and anybody in Congress at all, and six conservative justices on the Supreme Court are essentially making an issue of rolling back anything that has been done in the recent 15, 20 years, even by conservatives like the Koch brothers, who surprisingly were involved in some mass incarceration activity in favor of prisoners, you know, all you see in the Daily Mail and the Murdoch papers is pictures of homeless people in Portland, Oregon, or drug addicts in San Francisco. And basically, it's all being used as an argument that's kind of a mirror image of the anti-trans movement right now. Okay, here's a hot button issue. We're gonna we're gonna blame rising crime on on lax and liberal prosecutors and DAs. Um, you know, this is all George Soros's fault. And if you see crime going up, it's because of people like them and maybe because of Jonathan Fisher, too, and his movie <laughs> and his book. And I want to get to that. So I, I'm, I'm not going to ask you that question yet, but you're going to remember that it's coming. Okay. Yeah. The context of the release of this picture is fraught. But in the meantime, who are you? You know, if you ask me who I am, I've got two grandchildren sitting in the other room. I've just fed them lunch and we've been down by the water. Now I'm doing my podcast. I also happen to be an author of some books. But um, I'm just wondering who you are, as in whole life, not professionally, but other than writing and making movies, you know, what's your sort of thumbnail sketch story? Yeah, I guess I'm about your age, Frank, maybe a year or two. I'm 72. Um, yeah, you're I, ahead by um, a year. Uh -huh. And uh, New York City, born and bred. Uh, yeah. I, was, I was raised in the Bronx in the 1950s. So, of course, my hero was number seven, Mickey Mantle. Um, and then uh, they shoved, Robert Moses shoved the Cross Bronx Expressway through that borough. And so we had to skedaddle. We went out, wound up in Queens. And so my hero changed from Mickey Mantle to Tom Seaver. Um, I was a big fan of the New York City subway growing up. I was that obnoxious kid who always ran to the front car and shoved everybody else out of the way so I could stare out the front window. And um, I kind of... Uh, amplified that interest by taking a master's in transportation at Northwestern University in uh, in 1972, 1974, and parlayed that into a job with the MTA in New York City. And I basically worked for them for 26 years. Mm. I took, you know, that was sort of a living the dream as far as I was concerned. Um, I took early retirement in 2000, and then, you know, we've had the liberty to take other kinds of work. I did a gig with Ogilvy, the global communications firm, then the New York City Housing Authority, which, which actually led to our first uh, Seeing for Ourselves project, which I could talk about later. 
um, worked for the UN, worked for Memorial Sloan Kettering, and now I'm at Hearst Incorporated. But my passion actually now is the nonprofit, you know, seeing for ourselves, which I joined uh, in 2010 when it was founded. So that's that's and where we'll I am. Just talk talk oh, about that I, nonprofit a little bit. Yeah, yeah, just the you. nonprofit. It was founded by George Carano, who was, um, uh, you know, with whom I worked at the MTA for, for all those 26 years. He also took early retirement, I think a year before me in 99, and then kind of devoted his life to his passion, which was photography. Um, we tell this origin story in the film. Uh, George was on vacation in the UK in 2002, and he stumbled onto an exhibit of participatory photography uh, in London in a church basement, and it kind of blew his mind. He'd never seen anything like this before. And you know, we think the, you know, the participatory photography, um, which me is um, basically it's equipping and training marginalized communities to take control of their own public narrative by documenting their lives photographically. You know, it's a way of undoing negative stereotypes. It originated apparently among American aid workers in rural China in 1992. Um, and it's been growing more and more popular ever since. Uh, so anyway, he saw that exhibit. And actually, okay, just to, to, to step back for a minute, you could even trace the roots of this practice all the way back to Frederick Douglass, you know, who was the most photographed person of the 19th century, American of the 19th century. And he was very uh, uh, determined to, to use photography to correct the negative caricatures of Black Americans that were like pervasive in this country at the time. And then W.E.B. Du Bois later took that a step further by pointing out that it's the identity of the photographer that's also important. <laughs> so, so those are kind of ancient roots of the practice, but it did begin in 92, grew more and more popular. George discovered, just stumbled upon this in 2002. And then um, when he got, he resolved to to bring the practice back to the States when he when he returned home. So he staged an exhibit of this photography in 2004 uh, in the Chelsea Art District of New York City. Um, and lo and behold, Philip Jones Griffith st stumbled upon it on that. He is like one of the most foremost war photographers of the 20th century. He did fantastic work documenting the impact of Agent Orange on the Vietnamese. Um, and when he, he saw that exhibit in New York City and he befriended George and he convinced George to set up a uh, organization in New York that would um, for the same for, that that would be devoted to this kind of photography because it didn't exist in this country, not in a big scale. Mm. So with uh, with that kind of encouragement from a, war, a world famous photojournalist, George was off to the races. So to 2010, he founded a nonprofit called Seeing for Ourselves. And then um, uh, I took advantage of the fact that I was working at the New York City Housing Authority at the time. He got an, uh, I set up a meeting uh, with him, with, uh, with our top executive, who George then pitched the idea of conducting uh, a program of participatory photography at the Housing Authority, in the housing projects. Um, because he had realized, George had realized that um, uh, the image of the housing projects in the media in New York City in particular had been horrendous for the past generation. You know, it started back in the early 70s when you know, um, uh, white people started leaving. And so, of course, of course, that was an excuse for disinvestment by the government. Uh, and disinvestment led to all kinds of crime and disrepair, which led to uh, the media uh, uh, treating it um, in a public housing and the housing projects in New York in a very negative fashion, which mm -hmm. led the government to figure it was a, a, a losing hand and they stepped away. It was a vicious cycle. This and you know went on and on and on. So what George figured in 2010 was maybe if he brought this uh, participatory photography pro uh, uh, practice to the New York City housing projects, that could help undo uh, all of this. And and uh, I don't think anybody else but George could have convinced the housing authority to go ahead with this. Um, he's, George is a very persuasive guy. Uh, he was the one who, um, he had tremendous success actually at the MTA over his career and I basically was assisting him. But he convinced this executive to, uh, to give us a green light. And so we kind of embedded ourselves. Uh, George found a, uh, a photography teacher in the, in the person of Chelsea Davis. Chelsea had by sheer coincidence, had been conducting just this sort of photography 
it in uh, the oncology ward of St. Louis Children's Hospital back in 2006. And it was such a lucky find to, to get a hold of her. So she was uh, given a budgeted slot at the Housing Authority, and she started teaching this kind of practice mm. in the housing projects in Bronx and the housing projects in Manhattan, the housing pro projects in, in, in Brooklyn. It was a big success. Um, you know, it was no problem getting residents to sign up for this. Uh, she we did we did that project with uh, uh, disposable Kodak cameras. We had we had a, a gift from Kodak at the time, um, and uh, basically she was teaching kids and seniors because those were the, that was the population that was at home in the projects during the day. You know when when we could conduct our programming. So we got a wonder a wonderful collection of photographs. We packaged them with a backstory about um public housing and participatory photography in a book called project lives which was published by powerhouse in 2015 it got you know noticed all over the world basically uh but more to the point um it encouraged the city and the state to come back to the table and start refunding public housing did, in the did city that, did that project in some way impact or set up in a whole new way which is your current Absolutely. project it led, it led directly to it because this, the New York City said, hey, you guys did something for the housing projects. Why don't you do the same thing for the folks on probation? Because they also have been suffering negative stereotypes in the media for the past generation. You know, right. it all goes back to like the 1972, 1992 crime wave, yeah. uh, when the press started thinking of probation as somebody getting away with something, mm -hmm. right? Uh, ironically, just when probation turned pu punitive, in this country as another reaction to the crime wave. And again, you know, again, just like in public housing, it was kind of a negative cycle that was set up with terrible media coverage, uh, leading to uh, 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 probation uh, remaining punitive way longer than it should have in many jurisdictions, which led to even worse media coverage and on and on and on. So again, we by inserting ourselves there at the invitation of New York City, we were hoping to undo all that. And when when people open the book, um, I know a little bit, I've seen the trailer of the movie, but I'm un wondering in terms of the book visually, what have you got in the book? The book is a collection of the photographs taken mm -hmm. by folks on probation and their neighbors. How much text? Uh, there's, I think it's maybe 50-50 between text. And when you say edited it, were you editing the text or or choosing the photographs? We were helping to select the photographs, assembling them, and then we basically wrote the text entirely. It's by interesting. Ourselves. I'm gonna I'm gonna ask my producer Ernie because I'm very bad on last names. But Ernie, you remember that a long time ago we interviewed Gary and Fiona, uh, Fiona who used to run ABC's office in London, and Gary, who's one of the world's most famous photojournalists, who actually runs a school for young people in the south of France, bringing people from all over the world to do photojournalism back in their own countries. Very much mm -hmm. the same thing you're doing, but in this case, bringing them from places like Iran or, or wow. Sri Lanka or Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And and uh, it's called, <laughs> here we are, Ernie just, you know, this is why he gets the big bucks. Uh, seven, <laughs> it's the Seven Foundation and Gary Knight and Fiona Turner run it and they have a book out that we interviewed them about that's just in the other room that is on um negotiations peace negotiations globally which gary covered in ireland kosovo <laughs> all sorts of people if nothing else <clears throat> we're going to introduce gary knight and fiona turner to what you're doing great because it's like you guys are um mirroring each other in different yeah, contexts. Yeah. But especially the emphasis on young people telling stories that aren't being heard. Right. Anyway, right. so with that, with that little aside, uh, let me get to the question that I was talking about. And then I want to get back to this because this is fascinating what, what you're actually doing. But um, I don't know what the context was when you began all this. Uh, I'm sorry on the dates, but you know, there's pre-Trump and after Trump. Were you what were you doing about all this stuff? pre-Trump, if anything, and then how has that changed in the post-Trump environment of the Republican Party becoming this kind of, um, you know, exactly a party now tailored to picking on people on probation, somebody gets pushed under a subway car, 
they happen to have been on probation or recently incarcerated and all of a sudden you think they are a poster child for everybody on probation this kind of thing it just seems it's worse now than ever like what was it the central park five or something and then trump had to apologize and it had it wasn't <laughs> them to begin with is it just my imagination or is the context in which you are bringing this project out now bad fraud politically yeah. politicized i should say it, it, it's it's worse than it was um we started in 2010 okay and uh, okay. you know obama was president then um project lives came out in 2015 obama was still president then um but then uh when new york city said okay go do this uh for the probation department we applied to uh the national endowment for the arts for a grant uh, in 2017, when Trump was in the White House, mm -hmm. so we we were we were a little doubtful that about our chances, but lo and behold, it came through. I mean, I, you know, I don't know did Trump, did uh, Trump not change the NEA that as much as he did other agencies? I, I don't I don't know the truth, but we actually got the grant, and it was a gr the the grant from the NEA is what uh, encouraged the New York City Department of Probation to give our teacher a budgeted slot and let the program go forward. Now, I Trump did sign the First Step Act at the at the end of 2018, which mm. you know got some people out of prison, reduced some sentences. You know, it was you know on the order of like five thousand. I mean, and you could call it a drop in the bucket compared to the uh, you know five five point six million under uh, that are correctional supervision in this country uh, right now. But it was a step forward. Um, Van Jones was very important to that, and he was actually we actually show Van Jones in the movie. I mean, his whole yeah. shtick is you know trying to get the right and the left to work together, at least in some some areas like justice. Well, did, you, did you have contact with any of the Koch Foundation people? Because Koch, at some point, one of the Koch brothers did get into this. Yeah, we re I reached out to them uh, earlier this this year. The nonprofit, uh, I forget the name of it. Um, but never heard back from them, never which is which is kind of normal, you know. I mean, we, <laughs> we I'm a newbie document documentary filmmaker, and so I joined the support group. And what we what I heard from them constantly was, it's a numbers game. Ninety nine pe uh, people out of a hundred who you re reach out reach out to, you're never going to hear from. Yeah. You know. So. Hey, speaking of which, just a side issue here. Do you happen to have a copy of the book there? Yeah. Yeah. Could you, I, could you lift it up and show us the book and. Just let's pause a minute for you to show us some of the pictures in it. Um, it's a kind of an informal way to show it, but I'd like people <laughs> to see what this looks like or a page with text and picture. So we see, hold it up a little more and a little closer. Okay, yeah, I remember you matter. That's a good photograph. I saw that mind blowing, <laughs> good picture. Yeah, I, I loved it. Show me some more. Here's uh, pictures of the probation process. In, in okay, you got to move it around a little. I'm not seeing it properly. Okay. Yeah, I uh, see that, the probation process in the hall. Now lift it up a little more. Yeah. Okay. And then one below that. <laughs> below that is uh, 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 an interview at probation headquarters. I and mean, th these are like the, the, uh, the, ch the twin aspects of probation practice. Yeah. That there are home, home visits unannounced. And then also people have to troop into the probation office on a regular basis and be quizzed about their adherence to stipulations. And how does this book look physically <laughs> and aesthetically <clears throat> compared to the one on the housing development? Oh, thing? yeah, right. I, I, I can grab the other one. Grab one. Right. Right. I want to see it. Yeah. We have children and dogs and cats wander through this show. We can allow for someone <laughs> to grab a book. <laughs> okay, can you see this? This is yeah, very well. Lives. Yeah, open it up so I can take a look. I actually recognize that development. You pass it on the train coming in. Wow, it's polo grounds. Yeah, what's that? Yeah. It's the yeah, polo grounds. on the left. You see it on the left yes. of Amtrak. Yes, exactly. I always look at it thinking, what a fearsome sight that is. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Wow. Okay, so the, these so this. Are, yeah, I mean, the first thing to say about both of these books is they're sort of monumental works of art as well as social commentaries. And I was struck by looking at some of the photographs and the news material that you released of the quality of the photography. I wondered, were they all shooting digital or did you give these guys some 35 millimeter cameras and develop film or is it all digital? In in this project, uh, we gave them uh, digital single lens reflex 
Sigma's um, Sigma donated cameras, you know, so they're sort of yeah. the sponsor of this project. Uh, and then so they, they use their own cell phones, you know, of which have advanced hey, so hey. much. <laughs> yeah, absolutely you know? right. Um, yeah, so I thought the photography itself was very impressive, irrespective of the context or anything else. I just thought they were incre- some of the pictures are incredible and very revealing and achieve what you were trying to do in terms of humanizing the subject matter as in like, oh yeah, these people do have something to do with me. I understand this. I There's a sensibility there that, that, that cuts across the cultural and racial divide. So I just think it was terrific, um, you know, looking at those pictures. When, when it comes to the movie, tell us about the movie in terms of just um, not how it got made first, but what we'd be looking at. It's a half an hour. What's yeah. in the movie? What's in the movie? Yeah. Um, we tell the story about probation because probation is the dominant chair of New York, of America's criminal justice system. You know, there's like the three million on probation right now outweigh everybody in jail, in prison, or on parole. And yet it's almost completely unknown. So so what we felt we had to do in this book, because there's never really been a general interest book about probation, is to introduce readers to what this practice is all about. You know, that it was found that it's actually an American innovation. You know, it was it was it was uh founded in Boston, near where you are, Frank, uh in 1841 by a bootmaker of all things. I mean yeah. he just ha- he happened to be in police court one day uh, saw a drunkard, you know, about to be uh, sentenced to a long a jail term and told the judge, look, you know, give this guy to me. Let me de- let me let me get, let me deal with this guy for, for a few weeks. OK, and I'll come back with him uh, and let's see where we are then. And uh, lo and behold, three weeks later, uh, the guy was completely reformed. He would, you know, he sw- he legit he, he you know swore off drink. And that actually turned out to be true. Um, he, he never touched a drop the rest of his life. And uh, John, this John Augustus, this bootmaker, was off to the races. I mean, he had really set every element of the practice in place, you know, that there was going to be an investigation, there was going to be intake, that there was going to be supervision. And um, the practice eventually was, was first institutionalized in Massachusetts, again, mm-hmm. where you are, Frank, in 1878, not, not coincidentally. I mean, Massachusetts back then was like in the forefront of, uh, you know, recognizing the impact of poverty, you know, and they were abolitionists there. I mean, it was really an advanced state in this country. So it was no accident that probation uh, started up there. Gradually, it spread around the country and then uh, around to, uh, to other countries in the West. And now it's almost all over the world. So this practice, this criminal justice practice that's almost all over the world owes its uh, you know, owes a debt to this Boston bootmaker in 1841. Mm-hmm. So the film covers that, you know, maybe in as much time as I just talked about it, um, and then segues from that into uh, the project It's the project itself, because when we take probation up to the, the current time, we see that it has lost, it ha- in, in many jurisdictions, it lost its originally re- rehabilitative roots and became punitive. And the media started making fun of it and fun of people on probation. So we, it was an opportunity, you know, we, we, we were able, by establishing that point, we laid the groundwork for covering our project that we came in um, with our practice and uh, the people on probation and their neighbors were very excited about it. I should point out, Frank, that New York City Department of Probation, um, one element of its industry leading practice is that it does involve the community in all its programming. You know, so people on probation attended our classes, but also their neighbors attended our classes. And our teacher never asked, you know, who are you? Are you one, are you one or the other? You know, because that would have violated New York City practice. You know, the, New York City was really, really advanced in a lot of ways. I mean, they said they've stopped violating for technical violations, the kind of things that, you know, just routinely would send somebody on probation back to prison. They now give advance notice of uh, uh, heretofore unannounced home visits so people don't come charging through your front door unexpectedly. I mean, they're doing a lot to make probation practice more humane. So we were able to cover that in the movie as well, not, you know, elements of New York City practice as well as the, you know, this program per se. And then we showcase the photography and and uh, showcase the participants, all they had to say and what they revealed about themselves, 
thing that you know surprised us more than anything is that the program changed their lives. I mean, we were trying to you know change the brand of probation. We were trying to impart a marketable skill, you know, so folks when they got off probation, you know, would, could actually find work. But in, in, in taking photography, taking pictures. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, or just the art of visual storytelling, which is a you know a skill that's really in demand in in the business sector generally. Um, but what what they told us, and they told us on film, and so this is in the film, that this program changed their lives. And I think part of that is, funnily enough, is that um, photography let them realize, you know, the people who would miss this growing up, that everybody has their own point of view, that everybody mm -hmm. has their own perspective. You know, you're you know you're an artist yourself, you know, so you know that. But I think, um, you know, photography lends itself to this viewpoint perhaps more than the other arts because yeah. you, know, you know you're always making these choices like which lens which step the field which yeah. aperture everybody does it a different way and with um the proper training and the proper equipment everybody could take a great picture mm -hmm. you know I mean, not everybody has your you know your your artistic talent frank frank but I think everybody has the talent to make a great photograph. Absolutely, you know, and being in the right place. I forget which yeah. photographer it was. I always, I always remember this saying. I never remember the photographer, but something to the effect that someone was asking him in a class about something or other on photography and what kind of cameras he used, and he said very wisely, "The only important camera you own is the one you have with you." That's right. <laughs> that's right. And that's it, isn't it? That's yeah. the whole damn that's deal, right. right there. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> But in any yes, case, let me, let me no. switch gears here massively. And first of all, just highly recommend these two books in a whole new way, which is the new one. And then give me the title of the other one. Project Lives. Project, Project Lives. Lives. Yeah, yeah, because these are really important documents. Um, I mean, talking about American history, somebody will be looking at these books 200 years from now. And most of the authors I have on, including myself on this they won't, but I mean, you're you're putting down some documentary evidence of a of a moment in time that will be irreplaceable as time goes on. Um, by looking at two things people have ignored, let me ask you a tiny little technical thing: How does the interface of probation and parole manifest itself? Because it might be the similar population or the same as they roll from one to another. What can you just talk about that a little bit? Because a lot of the media, the right wing media hyperbole and caricature of people who have run afoul of one law or another is that these are all dangerous criminals they've all been paroled too easily they should all be in jail forever i i think in the public mind parole and probation are probably one and the same and i know they're not but you want to just That's talk right. a little bit about how that population is written off and denigrated and and, and now with so many republican people running um they're making generalizations about this population that are so similar to the way they talk about gay people and trans people yeah, yeah, and immigrants yeah. and everybody else. Yeah, people on parole are suffering from the same negative stereotypes. It's just what you said, Frank. You know, there could be one one instance of uh, somebody on parole going off the rails, and then yeah. that could be used to to delegitimize the entire practice. I yeah. mean, it, and I, and I think I, I may have made this point earlier that you know so many Americans confuse the two, probation and parole. Pro I mean, just to simplify things, probation is offered instead of incarceration. Sure. Parole is early released from incarceration. Yes. Um, but they, you know, the, but both of them, as you point out, suffer from similar, similar stereotypes. In fact, yeah. what 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 saddens me right now is that in Maine, right at the, right at the second, there's an effort to, to uh, reinstitute parole, which was actually eliminated back in the 1970s. We are the only state in the country that doesn't have a parole system. Mm -hmm. um, and we've got a Democratic governor who's not very enthusiastic about this movement to reinstate it. So it, uh, the odds don't look good, unfortunately. Um, but uh, New York, on by, by uh, uh, a different... Uh, uh, by, by contrast, New York State actually reformed parole in a huge way a year or two ago, because there too, like on probation earlier on in New York, technical violations were leading to uh, parole being uh, uh, rescinded and people winding up back in prison. And technical mm -hmm. violations could be like missing an appointment or uh, what you might do if you had a job 
you know, it's not that easy to balance a job and reporting to parole or probation officer all the time. You know, it's it's no picnic to live your life under constant supervision. Yeah, and I think one one other thing that New York has done is is reduce the number of stipulations or rules that these folks have to obey. So mm -hmm. it's no longer twenty four, including like uh, don't associate with disreputable characters, which in the yeah. in the view of the state could be your family, right? I mean, it's like yeah. you know how are you going to obey for that? It's impossible. Um, so New York has reduced them to just a few. They, the fact they New York doesn't even violate you if you're arrested because they, you know that could lead to being released with, without any charges ultimately. So they wait to see what happens we with see that. What it was for. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Ernie, yeah. Uh, my my producer just sent me a nice little message here in the chat section, which I'm going to read to you as a question. Given the increased criminalization of simply being poor in America, what do you think is the most important point we can make? To remove the to move the public toward rehabilitation rather than punishment across all these fields. I'm um, hopefully hopefully our our project can make can move can move the needle a little bit. I mean, it can't do everything, but that's exactly what we're trying to do is is yeah. is encourage punitive jurisdictions to come back to the original rehabilitative practice that, that yeah. John Augustus envisioned in Boston in 1841 when he got that drunkard out of, you know, out of prison. He said, I'm going to John rehabilitate. Augustus, uh, uh, was John Augustus a um, Quaker or something like that? I mean, was there something? Yeah, going on there? yeah, yeah. He does have a Christian uh, background. I'm not a sure Quaker exactly. background? I'm just curious. I'm not sure exactly. But something, um, I mean, there was some, there something, was something. Yeah, what he was doing. something, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I have a question for you, um, and uh, you know, just to change gears here from the rehabilitation question, and that is that um, it seems to me that with a film like this, that you know, would it be streamed at some point by someone so people could see it? Where would they be able to watch the movie? We're going to put links to all of your things wherever this is shown or or heard. And I'm just wondering if someone wants to watch the movie, what they can do. Go to our website, in a whole new way .com. It's there. You pay $2.99, just like on Amazon. You can, you know, watch it for three days. That's sort of the thing. Um, and what we're, we've been trying to amplify it in so many ways over the last couple of, couple of years. You know, we let the, we put the film out on the film festival circuit for a couple of years. Uh, now it's being shown on PBS on stations all over the country. Um, yeah, I saw that. And, and you know, the the, pur the purpose is to kind of build public support for what we're trying to do. You know, ultimately, it may be the decision of a legislature or a governor to uh, return to return probation to its rehabilitative function in a particular jurisdiction. But it's going to be a lot easier if there's some you know public support. And if if the film helps change the culture a little bit, maybe that support will be there. So that, it that's seems to be goal. more more of a state issue than a federal issue. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. I mean, there is such a thing as federal probation. <laughs> In fact, uh, I think Donald Trump uh, was paid a visit by a federal probation officer soon after his uh, uh, recent arraignment down in Florida. Um, but on the federal level, they conduct what's called pretrial services, not just not, not just uh, the regular probation, the the alternative to incarceration that it is elsewhere at the, at the local level. Federal probation actually succeeds generally um, uh, more is more successful than at the state level. It's much better funded, and you don't have enormous caseloads. I mean, one of the problems with probation over the years, really since uh, since the 1972-1992 era is that probation officers in some jurisdictions like Los Angeles in the 1990s had caseloads over 100, mm -hmm. 150. You couldn't possibly keep tabs on, on your charges with that kind of a caseload. I mean, well, it was the set, same sort of thing that happens in fam family court services with yeah. caseloads of people trying to keep char track of how children are being treated and so forth. It just is yeah. really yes. underfunded. Yes. What are, what are some of the, uh, I noticed a couple of these um, younger people, younger photographers. I mean, they're not really young people. They're different ages, but who had yeah. been taking some marvelous pictures, talking about how being part of your project, aside from the experience of probation itself, but the project itself has changed their lives. I'd like to yeah. know more about that. I'd like you to tell me a couple individual stories, if you could. 
Yeah, um, yeah let's call him Robert. Um, when he uh, first came to one of our classes, um, he seemed to, he, he took a seat apart from anybody else, uh, all by himself. He didn't say much. Our teacher asked, you know, what drew you to the cl class, Robert? Uh, you know, and it was it was like pulling teeth getting out of him. Um, and I think, you know, like Robert, like many people back then, um, uh, well, like many people even now across the country, view probation as something to grit your teeth and get through. Um, but the photography class, you know, got a hold of him. And gradually, week by week, he started um, uh, participating more and more in the classes, becoming more and more animated. And uh, eventually, in October of 2018, um, when the teacher staged a gallery exhibit in, in uh, the Tony uh, Dumbo section of Brooklyn, a gallery there of the best photographs, one of Robert's pictures was selected for the show. And so uh, he came to the opening and he was interviewed by a TV reporter. <laughs> um, and he said, you know, he was glowing. He, you know, you could not recognize Robert at that point from what, where he was when he first came to one of our classes. And I think it's, you know, giving people a platform to tell their own stories is so important. People who have been marginalized their whole lives. Um, and then compounding that, um, I think one of, the, one of the reasons why the, um, the, the gallery experience was so transformative for, for Robert was he had not had that much positive reinforcement growing up. And then that's true of so many people who wind up just as involved. You know, they haven't had positive reinforcement from their parents. They haven't had positive reinforcement from their teachers. And this can lead to trauma, you know, in, child, in, in, in a child. And that could lead to all kinds of um, uh, poor choices as the, you know, as the child grows into mm -hmm. adulthood. And if, if I had that kind of a, a background, I would be on probation myself or worse. Mm. You know, it could happen to anybody, and, you know. So it's certainly not, not a good, good thing for, any, for, the, for these folks to be demonized by any political party. What were the um, age ranges of people out there taking pictures for this project from youngest to oldest? Uh, the, in, uh, in the probation project, they range from about 16 to 80. In fact, in 80, we had, um, just to tell him and another story briefly, um, Michael, uh, I think he was in his 30s or 40s. He was uh, on probation. He, uh, he told his, and, and uh, uh, became enamored of the program, attended the class every single week. He told his father about it. And his father and he had never gotten along and they've been at each other's throats for decades, not just years, but decades. Well, his father came to the class. Carl, I think, is he's probably in, around seventy, um, and there was a change in their relationship because they started talking about photography. They started talking about you know what makes a good picture, and that that kind of opened the door to a total reconciliation of father and son. And that Carl actually told this this story of the reconciliation to the city council and. Uh, in uh, December of 2018, when uh, when the when the city council wanted to know all about this program, so it was it was such a a marvelous thing, and the yes. council thought so too. Go ahead. Yeah, the council thought so too. <laughs> that, it, it just uh, seems to me that it's such a powerful uh, project on so many levels because, of course, it's drawing attention to the probation process, which was started for such good motives by someone who was trying to keep people out of prison, out of jail. Mm -hmm. and give them another chance. So it's a wonderful answer to mass incarceration in a in a very creative way. And then Sorry. your project allows people to tell their stories and allows the rest of us to see them as human beings in the context of their stories. But in addition to that, judging by some of the photographs I've seen, some of these folks actually are real artists. They are. And yeah. you have given them you know, you're Lorenzo de' Medici and you've got the young Michelangelo and you're saying, come live with me and learn how to do this. In other uh, words, there, there is an actual aspect of something a lot older than 19th century do-goodism in Boston. We're, we're, yeah. talking Renaissance, we're talking Renaissance Florence here. This is how art starts. Yes, right. And you're, you know, and, and that's, to me, in a weird way, I know this will sound crazy, but that's who I am. Yeah. Most interesting thing I think about your project for me is not the good you do, 
or changing my image of incarcerated or unincarcerated or probationary people or candidates. It's that you're you're helping people in a very marginalized position become artists. Yeah, that's huge. Yeah. Yeah. But it's it's huge in so many ways. You know, yeah. it, it's not do goodism creativity. It's real creativity. You know, when you look at these pictures, you're thinking of people like Annie Leibovitz. You're not thinking of good works. That's, I mean, yes, they're good right. pictures that yes, I hang on my, I'd hang on my wall. <laughs> like, holy uh -huh. shit, yeah. this is a great photograph. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. I just wanted to start there because I'm I'm always suspicious of things done for nice reasons when it comes to art. <laughs> You know, I, I don't like editing things to make everybody feel comfortable or all that kind of uh, stuff makes me very cold. And I just yeah. want to say from my point of view as an artist and someone who understands a little about photography, that this uh, the project is impressive from the point of view of, hey, these are actual photographs. This is good stuff. So I just am stunned by that. Uh, and, and the people themselves taking the pictures, if they're getting some feedback on this stuff, will always feel more creative and empowered for the rest of their life, whether they do more photographs or not. I hope they keep going with yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In fact, one of the things we were, we were careful to do was um, actually make, um, let, let uh, the most promising students start teaching the classes, you know, so, the, so that. They, got that, they, they got that, that experience as well. And, and um, one of them, uh, who we showcased at the very beginning of In a Whole New Way, uh, um, Henry, uh, was so talented that we that neither the probation department nor our own non nonprofit had any choice except we had to make him associate director of the entire photography program, We're, which he, and he continues in that role to this day. Um, he What's actually, his background? Uh, what, what, what was he doing he, before? For all this, I'm not asking what anybody well, on probation for because it's none of my yeah. business. But I'm just yeah. curious, what sort of a person are we talking about? Well, um, he was uh, in Brooklyn uh, when he was 18. Um, he was hustling in the park and in uh, near, in, I think, in the Bedford Stuyvesant section of Brooklyn. And one night, his favorite cousin uh, was shot dead, and that was kind of uh, an epiphany for him because. Because Henry, he you know uh, 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 visited that park constantly, um, and he figured, hey, you know that could have been me if I was, you know, the next day if I was there, that would have been me lying on the ground. So, and he, he tells us this story both in the book and the film. He realized from that point forward, he knew he had to find a better path. You know, he knew that the, this hustling shtick was not going to get him anywhere except to bad places. So he didn't know exactly what. Um, in his third, it would be like 15 years later, uh, in his 30s, he did something, I don't know what, and I don't want, I don't want to know what, but something that got him on a probation sentence uh, in New York City. And then he discovered the photography class. Mm. And just like Robert, who I told about earlier, when he first went there, you know, he was skeptical, he was suspicious. Um, you know, the teacher and the three of us in this nonprofit, we don't look like the, uh, the, the folks down there. Um, and we've had advantages that, of course, that they haven't. Um, so there was a lot of skepticism to overcome, but he took to it like a duck to water. Mm. Um, he, he said, this is it. This is what I was put on earth to do. Mm. Um, <laughs> and uh, when, when his, his uh, photography teacher was taking a master's in social work at the Columbia, Columbia University at the time, she brought Henry with him to one of his classes and introduced him. And he was so proud. You know, you could just see that he was such a different person mm. from the person that had, you know, skeptically edged into this photography class a couple of years ago. Um, and he's uh, just been a wonderful, uh, one, wonderful person to know as well as super talented. Mm. Hey, I should have done this about 15 minutes ago, but I'm going to reintroduce you. Um, if you are listening to or watching this, this is In Conversation with Frank Schaefer, and I am Frank Schaefer, an author of various books like Crazy for God, my memoir of my journey out of the evangelical world, um, et cetera, et cetera, and novels like Portofino. Today, we are talking with Jonathan Fisher, and he's the co-editor of a book, A Whole New Way, under Undoing Mass Incarceration by a Path Untraveled. And the wonderful untraveled path is that he's turned a whole bunch of people in the system 
um, of probation and otherwise into photographers. And those pictures are in the book. And then also the writer director of a new film, A Whole New Way, which is um, the same material, including also interviews with the the subjects and has created something where both art, photography, and rehabilitation all become one thing with a tremendous purpose. Um, when you look at the pictures, you'll be stunned by the quality. Uh, if you like this podcast, please like it in the online sense of sharing it. Um, please subscribe to my Substack. And on Substack, we have a lot of stuff going on, including regular commentary by me called It Has to Be Said. So Substack is where you'll find us in all sorts of other places in conversation with Frank Schaefer, and we're talking to Jonathan Fisher. So Jonathan, what are you working on uh, as we speak, both in terms of this project, uh, getting it out, future projects, or your passion for the folks um, that you have been working with, who you've turned into photographers, basically charting their own course, but also recording their little slice of history. I, little, not in a diminutive sense, but their slice of history, their, their, their moment. Uh, what, what, what else are you doing? Yeah. What we're trying to do, I th uh, besides uh, uh, partaking in podcasts like, you know, like yours, Frank, um, and trying to get press about it, uh, we're scheduled to screen a film at a plenary session of the American Probation and Parole Association's annual conference in New York City this August, and they expect 3,000 people there, 3,000 community corrections professionals. I mean, that is a wonderful audience to screen this film to, and to, to where we can really try to leverage the film for reform, because yeah. there'll be folks there from rehabilitative jurisdictions, and there'll be folks there from punitive jurisdictions, who I hope will be persuaded that there's another route to travel, you know, there's another way. And that uh, if we, I mean, what we really are after, of course, is that if probation returns to its re rehabilitative routes throughout the country, it would be viewed more widely as an alternative to locking people up. Mm -hmm. You know, we already lock up more of our people than any other country on the planet. And that's, that's, that's not us and not, not where we should be anyway. Yeah. Um, so that's, uh, that's the, the, the thing we're most looking forward to that conference in August um where we hope hopefully that the the, uh, the film could uh the film's impact could go to a whole new level in terms of other work we've already actually started on a third initiative um which is equipping and training high schoolers to picture their climate future and um one might think well are high schoolers as marginalized as public housing residents or folks on probation in our view, they are because they're, you know, they're the ones with the most skin in the game. And yet their views, apart from Greta Thunberg, have not really been taken into account in the national conversation about climate change. Um, so we think this is an opportunity for them to get their imagery and therefore their voice, uh, their imagery taken into account and therefore their voices heard. So I already conducted a pilot project just this spring at the Cape Elizabeth High School. Um, got some great photographs, great, great uh, captions. Um, and George Carano, the, the director who lives in Bayshore, Long Island, is planning to do a similar project down where he lives, even um, on the uh, reservations of Native Americans down there. There are high schoolers who might be able to be brought into this project. And that would be great because you talk about marginalized populations. There's hardly anybody more marginalized than them. And they, of course, were, were great stewards of this environment before we all got here. Um, so that's that's something which uh, we're very excited about in terms of our next initiative. And would this be a, another book and film project? Might be. I mean, you know, we probably don't have the money to, uh, to, to to do a film like we just did with this one, but at least a, you know, at least maybe a fifteen minute film and an article, if not a book. But we'll we'll find we'll find some way of mm. getting it out there and amplifying you know what what comes out of it. Yeah, have you ever have you ever thought about other projects related to these? As in, you know, you're talking to people on probation and housing projects, and now uh, high school students' view of the environment in the future as they see it. You know, what tremendous ideas! And I, I just wonder, in the best of all worlds, who else would be taking pictures that otherwise we don't think of as people that we pay attention to, or listen to, or hear from? 
Yeah, you know, there have been other participatory photography projects with other populations. Um, the incarcerated, believe it or not, as, as difficult logistically as you think that would be. Um, homeless people, people yeah. that, you know, um, uh, immigrants, um, people with uh, mental illness, hmm. um, people with physical disabilities. I mean, there were various populations that tend to be portrayed in the media as being perhaps, you know, a little dodgy or a little bit unworthy of paying mm. full attention to. And I think all of those kind of, all the all uh, those folks might be able to benefit by, you know, by people doing a project like this. Mm. So on a day-to-day -day basis, um hour by hour, you're not always talking to me on a podcast. So what are you what do you occupy yourself with? Oh. You know, I I do childcare, I do some writing. Uh, take care of my wife, Jeannie. I build a lot with my hands physically. This is what I do. Um, turn out ideas for Ernie to put on various <laughs> media platforms, uh -huh. respond to the news. Um, you know, my day's a little different like that, waiting for a new book to come out, just send it to my agent, see if she sells it. The life of an artist, the life of a writer. Um, what are you day to day? Well, I have a day job. Um, it's with Hearst corporation you know citizen came and you know, that's that 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 those guys and uh they're great they're a great company now uh to work for i'm in the it department i'm not a geek i'm mean, i you know i don't know that much about uh technology but i you know I'm, I'm used for communications within the it field so email newsletters and things you know re annual reports and things of that nature uh and it's great to be able to pay the bills because i'm an older dad uh and my wife is an older mom um we're in our uh she just my wife just turned 70 this week i'm 72 uh our daughter is um uh 22 she's uh going into her third year at case western mm -hmm. and our son is uh 18 he just graduated from cape elizabeth high school he'll be attending so he, he still hasn't finalized the, his his which college he's going into in September, but uh anything that can help pay those those enormous bills uh we're grateful for What's the Hearst company doing these days? Oh, they, you know, they expanded. They were originally newspapers, of course. That was yeah. Citizen King. And the San Francisco Chronicle, I think, is still the biggest moneymaker for them. But all kinds of magazines, um, broad TV stations that they've expanded into uh, transportation maintenance, both uh, auto automotive and aviation uh health uh information systems i mean they that sort of and even fitch the credit rating agency i mean all these other businesses are are essentially information provision you know yeah so because it would of, see, seem to me the natural arc of their history the hearst corporation would have been that you know either they found ways to sustain themselves and when newspapers are disappearing or they haven't and i guess from what you're saying hearst has found ways to sustain it yeah Yes, of course. And they're changing, of course. Everybody in the media is changing, you know, especially now with ChatGPT. I mean, everybody's wondering, you know, what, what kind of a new world that's going to bring about. Yeah. And, uh, you know, are they going to be fake newspapers? I mean, are we going to have to watermark the, the, the digital newspapers to prove to consumers that they're, they're the genuine article? I, I, who knows what's coming down the pipe? Yeah, We're nothing all trying good. To out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Ernie just put a note to me saying Frank is an is an entirely AI avatar. Well, no, actually, I'm sitting here. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I the real Frank Schaefer passed away years ago, but Ernie's very clever and makes me continue. I need one of those. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll we'll keep going forever. If you if I'm still doing this in thirty years from now, you'll know something weird's going on. Uh -huh. Yep. <laughs> Yeah. So anyway, before we roll out of here, um, again, I want to reiterate Ernie's question and and go a little deeper into that in terms of what can we do toward public rehabilitation becoming a thing rather than punishment? And how do you see this fitting in in our present political climate? Because it just seems to me that everything you're calling for, you know, the, the Republican Party now has become the party of a punitive look at even our youth and you know the, a lot of the anti-woke stuff they just don't like young people they've written them off you're giving cameras to high school students to take a look at their idea of our 
environmental future, they're basically writing them all off as a bunch of woke whatever, you know, people taking shots at Bud Light cans because they had some influence <laughs> on they didn't like. This doesn't seem to be the climate. <clears throat> you know, an AR-15 clutched in every in every trembling hand doesn't seem to be the non-vengeance oriented climate in which the ideas you're pushing would thrive. And I just want to push a little more on that. We've consciously tried to couch both the book and the film to appeal to as wide an audience as possible. Mm. And, you know, I mentioned, you know, at one point, even Donald Trump was into justice reform. He did sign that First Step Act in, in December 2018 with, you know, prodding by Kim Kardashian and folks like that. Um, you know, you're right that things are not like that now. I mean, the, the pandemic did, you know, lead to a little lead to a crime spurt. So, you know, there were so many, uh, there were growing numbers of Republicans who were joining Democrats and pushing for justice reform back in 2018. Well, that seems to have gone by the wayside. And mm. it's harder and harder, as you say, to find people on that, you know, on that side of the aisle who want to participate in, in, uh, in, in, in promoting rehabilitation and instead of just locking people up. But in the Republican state center in, down in the South Shore of Long Island where George lives, he's, he's Republican. He's always been very supportive of this and uh, he's still trying to promote this. He'll be speaking at a gallery. We're gonna have a gallery show in Bayshore in September. He's gonna, he'll be speaking at this. You know, mm -hmm. there are still some folks on that side of the aisle who have responded to this and I think I think it's because the approach we took was, um, I, I think the book and the film managed to create sympathy and empathy for the plight of these folks without over guilt tripping other folks. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a very thin line. You know, you it's trying to trying to find this sweet spot where you can, you know, where, where you can appeal to, you know, sort of both sides in the, in, in this wildly, wildly, you know, de yeah. de divisive climate right now is almost impossible. But that's what we were aiming at. And maybe in a few instances, maybe we hit the target. Yeah. You know? And that that's what our hope is, that we can just parlay that and uh, and show people who might have been uh, with us back in 2018, might have stepped away uh, after the pandemic, show them that, wait a minute, you know, the narrative is wrong. You know, and crime yeah. is not out of control in New York City. And, you know, in fact, it's better. It, it, it's safer than it was a year ago. And more, more to the point, New York City, where all these probation reforms have taken place since the late 1990s, is one of the safest big cities in the country. Well, and the world, actually. <laughs> yeah, for that matter. It's yeah. safer than London in terms of bodily harm. Hey, yeah. I want to wrap this up. I just want to say my guest has has been Jonathan Fisher. Um, the project is in a whole new way, and it's about um, what he is doing and what people he's working with have been doing in terms of giving cameras to people in the probation system to tell their stories. And it just turns out, and you can take it from me, when you look at the movie or look at the book, you'll know I'm telling you the truth. They happen to be some very, very great, stunning photographs, which earn the title of art. So it's surprisingly wonderful. Um we will share this with everyone we know. This is going to be a hot issue through the election because 2024 kind of has this unofficially on the ballot, as it were. I mean, you happen to have punched a hot button. Thank you. You know, did you know that you're now a controversial figure? Uh, but I, I, I also think on a note of hope that I would just say, look, you know, we all have... Um, a little bit of fatigue with the divisions in our country. Wouldn't it be wonderful if this was one of those things that could actually bring a few people together saying, look, let's just lay aside the Republican, Democrat, liberal, conservative thing. You know, maybe there's a gun owner in Montana and a liberal Democrat in, in, <laughs> in Maine who can agree that um, the idea of not locking up everybody, but 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 giving them some sort of a shot and, and that these are creative people and should should be treated with some dignity that might come out of some of that religious right concern for values. I mean, there is yes. there are some threads there that you can talk about. 
Yes, yes. I mean, just just what you know, the left is concerned about social justice and doesn't sort of doesn't want to lock people up. Well, the right is concerned about redemption and also about saving money. You know, so yeah, I, I, there is common. There's room. There's common ground. You know that that it can is. be. You know, we, we can. We hope, 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 hope. We hope can achieve here. Good. Well, Jonathan, I hope this is useful to you and that you can share this yourself on whatever platforms you've got. My point of view. This has been a great conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Frank. Take care. All the best for the project. Stay in touch. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Yep. Bye-bye.